Hello class, I'm sorry I can't be there with you today. This lecture is going to be about um, DNA and how we compare DNA sequences together to determine ancestry, detect diseases, and even see what proteins do. I'm going to go over this with you quickly in a video lecture, and then when I get back there tomorrow, we can cover any questions you've got and uh, make sure everybody got the correct notes from um, the discussion or the, the lecture you're listening to here today. So we're going to start with this uh, concept of being able to compare DNA between species to look for differences that show us common ancestry and can give us clues into potential uh, diseases that species or individuals may carry around, okay? In order to start the process of obtaining DNA from particular samples, we have to do a few steps, and we're going to go over all three here. Uh, the first step is extraction, and extraction is all about removing or extracting DNA from an organism. Removing DNA from an organism. That can be as simple as breaking up the tissue. Um, it can, you know, if the organism is small enough, you may be able to grind up the entire organism and remove the DNA from that organism. Uh, depending on what you're looking at, you may need to sample or you could use an entire organism. But in order to get DNA out of a cell, you basically have to break it, treat it with some alcohol, and break down the proteins that are in the DNA to release it from, um, from the other things it's connected to. So in order to extract DNA from a sample, in order to compare it, we first have to get it out of the cell. The next thing we have to do to our DNA is amplify it. And we do that through a PCR reaction. PCR stands for polymerase chain reaction. It's not that important as long as you understand what the PCR reaction does to DNA. And it amplifies it. Okay, the goal of a PCR reaction is to amplify the amount of DNA in your sample. I was going to say the amount of DNA in a sample. Now, why would we do that, right? You know, we've we've crushed a cell, we've extracted the DNA out of it. Why can't we just look at it at that point? Well, actually, there's not that much DNA in the sample you've just extracted, and it's very hard to see it with the naked eye. In a lab, it's very uh, useful to be able to compare DNA samples together if you can just look at them instead of put each one under the microscope and scan it um, that way. So instead, we amplify the DNA, which just basically means to make more copies of it. In order to make more copies of it, you... Uh, go through this three-step process where you denature the um, molecule. By denature, uh, I mean break apart or split, okay? DNA is double-stranded, and so in order to replicate it over and over and over again, we're first going to need to denature it or split it up. We basically do that with heat, okay? Um, sorry. We'll do this in the lab later on in the year after break. Um, we're going to run a lab where we use the PCR machine uh, and we amplify some DNA. So in order to get that process done, we have to first heat up the DNA so it breaks. We then are going to connect or anneal primers to the strand. We do that as the strand cools down. Primers, remember, are short pieces of RNA that can initiate the making of a new DNA strand. They're also required for the enzymes to work. So the annealing process is just that, the attachment of primers. The last piece to this is the extend piece. And the extend piece requires nucleotides, which are A, C, T, and G. 
ligase, which is going to connect our Okazaki fragments together. We're going to make a lot of them through this process. And TAC polymerase, which you may not have heard of before. TAC polymerase is this pretty much the same enzyme as DNA polymerase, although it is not going to break down in the presence of heat. Most enzymes will denature if they're heated or cooled rapidly, and TAC polymerase doesn't do that. It's a very special enzyme. So you could say, um, all right, sorry about that, that uh, TAC polymerase is a heat resistant DNA polymerase. Okay. Um, that's really important uh, in this process because throughout the, the whole time you're going through a PCR reaction, you're constantly heating and cooling and heating and cooling the molecule in order to split it up and make more. Now, heat it up, cool it down, make more. These four here get heated, broken, and once they're cooled, more primers anneal and extend the molecule. And so through heating and cooling, this TAC polymerase enzyme has to stay in the same shape in order to maintain this method of replication. And it does. It, it, it serves its purpose really well in that respect. So now at the end of a PCR reaction, which can take a few hours, you've gone from having a single copy of DNA, maybe a few, depending on how many cells you've broken, to having thousands of copies of DNA that you can now see with the naked eye and put um, or use in a lab. So once we've extracted our DNA and amplified it and made more copies of it, now we can go to the process of electrophoresis where we detect differences in DNA by separating out the strands. So how does this device work? An electrophoresis machine uses a gel, just kind of very similar to the ones you'd use to grow bacteria on. The gel has a spongy inside with a bunch of holes in it, and that uh, spongy gel is basically used like a filter to filter out DNA strands. That's, that's all it is doing. So if you can think of this blue block of gel as kind of like a, a big filter, then you might imagine you being able to put amounts of DNA at the top of this gel. And this image actually uses proteins, but, but DNA is the same concept. So you might imagine being able to put seven different samples of DNA in, at one end of the gel. What you have in that sample is a bunch uh, or, you know, a bunch of really long strands of DNA. If you want to compare samples of DNA between uh, individuals, in order to detect differences, you first actually have to cut the DNA up. The enzyme we're going to use to cut DNA samples is the same one we use to make plasmid DNA that was um, edited. And those are restriction enzymes. Remember that restriction enzymes cut DNA at specific sequences. They also leave sticky ends. Okay. So it is the same enzyme we're talking about in this activity or in this um, lab procedure that's going to be used to cut DNA again, okay? Now, why would we do this? Well, we've got seven different samples of DNA up here in our top, the top of our gel. If we want to compare differences between them, we have to cut them with a restriction enzyme to see those differences. Because restriction enzymes are super specific, remember, we compared them to crazy scissors in class. Because they're super specific, they're only going to cut at specific sequences. So pretend the sequence they cut is something like this, A-A-A-T-T-T. -T -T. So they're going to only cut at sequences that are like this, right? What that means is that 
any time there's a that sequence in these samples, it's going to make a cut at that point. And because these are seven different samples, they will not have the exact same amount of those sequences. And so there will be different cut sites, different uh, different amounts of restriction enzyme, or sorry, fragments made, fragments of DNA made in each sample. Each sample will be cut differently by the restriction enzyme because they're all different and they're all going to have different amounts of those patterns of nucleotides. Okay, so after all those large, after all those samples are cut by the same restriction enzyme, we can then run them through the filter and different sized fragments can be detected. How does this filter work? Well, DNA is inherently negative. And so if we put all the DNA samples at the negative end of a, basically a battery, and turn the battery on, then as the battery runs, or as, this, as electric current passes through this gel, the positive end will attract the DNA strands, and they will flow towards that positive electrode. So all we're doing in a gel electrophoresis uh, apparatus is we're running electric current through a gel, and because um, you know electrons are flowing to this positive end, the DNA will be, ex be uh, pulled through the gel in that same direction. Now this is a big filter, okay? Remember, this is the gel is like a big filter. So which strands are going to have an easier time getting through the filter? Those are smaller ones. And so because smaller ones can get through the filter a lot faster and easier, they will make it farther down this gel. Larger fragments, larger pieces of DNA won't get as far because they will get caught in the filter and slow down. So even though all these bands look the same, the band down here is full of a bunch of small pieces of DNA, while the band up here is full of a bunch of large pieces of DNA. They were all cut with the same fragments, and so um, because we can see now seven different samples cut with the same fragments, we can compare, oh, which samples had the same fragment sizes? Um, and, you know, you could take a look at, like, something like this. Well, look, all seven of them shared this band of DNA. And so because they shared that band of DNA, maybe that shows some amount of relatedness, or maybe they all carry a similar gene. You notice that, you know, in one or two instances, right, sample three and six show this band. Um, actually, <laughs> three, five, and six. What does that say about those three samples? Are they carrying around a weird allele that we're not uh, seeing in the other samples? Um, is that some detector that we can use to, uh, or some clue that we can use to detect diseases in certain organisms? There are a whole host of things you can get out of comparing DNA samples uh, between individuals, and this is just one of the ways we can see evidence, and uh, really another way we can see evidence uh, for evolution. So that's how a gel electrophoresis machine works. I'd like to go through a practice problem with you. Um, so maybe I'll uh, try and um, extend the uh, PowerPoint here a little bit. Let's see how much time we're at here. 14 minutes, okay. Um, let me try and do this here. Slide, okay. So you can try this one on your own and, um, and see how, how easy you find it as we, um, as we think about what we just did. So uh, if I were to have, uh, let's see, uh, sorry, uh, three DNA strands, right? So I have strand one, strand two, and strand three. And let's say in this strand, let's, say, let's just say in all the strands, we're going to have a, 
a sequence of nucleotides that's 100 bases long. So all of these are 100 bases long. Let's say I cut the first one right down the middle, leaving me a strand of, well, actually, let's, let's move a little farther over. So let's say we have a strand of 55 nucleotides and 45 nucleotides. And this one down here, I'll cut it a little differently, uh, 30 and 70. And um, uh, let's say in this last one, I cut it here where I have 30 um, and maybe another 30 and 40. Okay, so so that would be our, our DNA samples, right? If I was going to run those on a gel and compare them, what would it look like on a gel? So let's say I have sample one, I put sample two next to it, and then I have sample three. And remember, this is the negative end of the gel. So when I turn on the electric current, the DNA is going to run down this gel. For strand one, strand one has two fragments, a 55 sized fragment and a 45 sized fragment because we cut the DNA, sorry, we cut the DNA one time right there. So what is that going to look like here? Well, I'll have two pieces of DNA, a 55 sized fragment, which doesn't travel as far as the 45 sized fragment. So that's what would be my DNA sample for, uh, or DNA fragment pattern for sample one. For sample two, I also have two fragments because I only made one cut, a 30 and a 70 fragment. The 70 one's going to end up somewhere up here because it really doesn't travel as far as the other ones. 55 travels farther than 70. But the 30 size fragment should go pretty far. It's smaller than any of the other ones you've seen, so it should end up farther down the gel, more towards the positive end. The third sample would have three fragments because I cut the DNA in two spots. So I'd have two 30s. Even though those are two 30s uh, in the strand, it's only going to show up as one band because they're, all, they're both going to end up in the same location as the other 30. So these two fragments will be down here. I've also got a 40-sized 40 40 fragment, and that's a little smaller than the 45, so maybe I put that one here. That would be what the third sample would look like. Even though I have three fragments, two of them are the same, and so they will end up in the same spot on the gel. So this would be kind of what you'd see here if you ran a gel. We'll do an example on Thursday, um, and I can answer questions about this too, as we uh, review on Thursday. The last thing I wanted to talk to you about is something that scientists have discovered through learning about DNA and comparing DNA um, and you know how enzymes work between species. There's this new, uh, a new discovery was made uh, several years ago um, and it pertains to RNA. The concept here is called RNA interference. The I stands for interference. And you can also think about it as RNA silencing. Amazingly, our cells and other eukaryotes have this mechanism built into their DNA that allows the cell to recognize viral DNA and destroy it. Um, we actually discovered this through um, a whole series of experiments, one of those being with flowers, which you're going to watch later in this video. Um, how does this process work? Well, when, when a virus injects its DNA into, or RNA, into a cell, sometimes it can be injected in the form of double-stranded RNA, where it actually connects to itself, it folds in on itself. Your cells are all programmed to cut double-stranded RNA, and the enzyme that cuts it is called dicer. You all have that. Dicer only cuts double-stranded pieces of RNA. Once those are cut, they're now referred to as small interfering, interfering strands of RNA, or siRNA. siRNA, whether it comes from an, a virus or whatever other source is going to combine with a silencing complex and form something called RISC, 
risk is now an enzyme that will hunt down strands of RNA that match the target sequence it was given and destroy them. This helps you fight off viruses. Our scientists, though, have learned to use this to our advantage because if there's ever a protein that is being made at too high a quantity, it should have a lot of RNA strands in the cell. If scientists can shut down the making of that RNA, then they can shut down the making of the protein and stop whatever problem existed in that cell. Scientists can also use this technology to just shut down genes and see what that effect is. And that's really beneficial in determining you know, which proteins are active in which organisms, how do they use them, and possibly how, we're, how are we related together through the use of those proteins, okay? So just to summarize that a little bit, RNA interference can be used to silence or turn off, silence the making of proteins, okay? The proteins that are being made can either be viral or just uh, due to some genetic mutation. And if that's the case, they can either help the patient or, or um, you know, stop them from getting sick. Uh, lastly, again, we can use RNA silencing to just discover the, the purpose behind different genes. Um, purpose of certain genes, and that can give us clues as to how they work, what they are used for, and how they're seen in different species and different genes. Okay, that's going to end our talk today. If you have any questions about any of that, I can, I'd be happy to go over it on Thursday. I'm going to have the substitute play this NOVA video for you now, so you can get a little more information about RNA silencing. And that's about it. So I hope you have a good day. Thanks for listening.